we continue with more of Gauss's law. And we're first going to relate this to conductors that are in what we call electrostatic equilibrium. In conductors, which particles specifically are free to roam throughout the material? And that would be the conduction electrons, not all the electrons, only the ones in the outer energy levels, or even some of those, definitely not core electrons. We're going to call those conduction electrons. In terms of what electric charges are doing, electrostatic equilibrium means that the charges are no longer moving. That's what electrostatic equilibrium means. And it definitely does not mean that the net charge on an object is zero. That is not what electrostatic equilibrium means. It means the charges aren't moving anymore. It doesn't mean that the net charge on the object is zero. This next thing is important. For any conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, all of the net charge is at the surface. And the magnitude of the electric field within the conductor is zero. When you have a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, the magnitude of the electric field inside of it is zero. This figure shows a conducting sphere, not an insulating sphere. In a previous video, we met an insulating sphere where charge was distributed uniformly throughout the volume of the sphere, and that's not the case here. Here we have a conducting sphere, so this is a metal ball, a cannonball, you might say, having a certain radius and a net charge, and that net charge, as we just talked about, is at the surface. We want to find the electric field when we are inside this cannonball and when we're outside it, and then we're going to draw a graph. Inside, the electric field is equal to zero. We just said that. Now let's prove that to you using Gauss's law. Gauss's law, as you recall, says that the charge that's enclosed divided by epsilon naught is equal to the surface integral of E dot dA. And for little r less than big R, that means this. That means that we would need a Gaussian sphere that has a radius that's smaller than the radius of the cannonball. And what is the net charge that's enclosed in there? Zero, because all the charge is at the surface. So that means in the equation here, this numerator, Q enclosed, goes to zero. And if Q enclosed goes to zero, when we integrate the area, this Gaussian cylinder definitely has an area, so that's not equal to zero, which means that the electric field has to be zero. So you can prove that by Gauss's law. What about when little r is greater than big R? So now we're going to have a Gaussian sphere. Remember, this is a sphere, it's not a circle, where now little r is bigger than big r. Let's just start off just like we always do. Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught is equal to the surface integral of E dot dA. What's the charge that's enclosed here? In this picture, you can see the total charge that's enclosed is capital Q. So the numerator on the left side goes to capital Q. When we integrate this, the electric field at each of these points, because of symmetry, is equal. So that means we can integrate dA. And when we integrate dA, that's just A. So what is the surface area of this Gaussian surface? Isn't it 4 pi little r squared? And when we solve that for the electric field, it looks to me like it's going to be capital Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, which incidentally is exactly the same equation as for a point charge. Outside this cannonball, it is as if all of the charge is at a point. If we're going to draw a graph for this, the electric field within r is zero, and then the graph falls away 
according to 1 over r squared, according to the equation that we've just derived here. So E is proportional to 1 over r squared. 